Hi, this is Rahman Sheikh. Welcome to Fortnightly Railway Transportation Systems Podcast. I am the host and railway systems specialist working in this industry for 24 years and counting. This podcast is primarily focused on railway experts who have vast amount of experience and contributed greatly to this amazing industry. This is not a technical seminar, but focuses on feel-good stories, individual journeys, their success and failures, motivating younger generation to kickstart their career in railways and creating a sense of pride for the railway people who devoted their lives on the most environment-friendly public transportation. Our guest for this fortnight is Wayne Cooney, the Principal Systems Integration Manager at MTR Corporation Limited. Wayne started his professional career in December 1998 as an IT and communications trainee. He finished up his traineeship and commenced in the railways in 2002 as a maintainer in the Railcorp Communications and Control Systems Division. Working his way through a distinguished career of 20 plus years of design, delivery and commissioning of signaling control, automatic train protection and overall rail systems of major and mega rail projects. He is a bit of career diversity too and commissioned the traffic management and control systems for North Connex Road Tunnel. Wayne has worked in operations and maintenance projects and the entire project life cycle. He has even previously part owned and run a rail system consulting business. Today, he works exclusively for MTR as one of its key rail system delivery experts in Australasia. Wayne has postgraduate education in telecommunications engineering from Wollongong University. In between kids, sports, Wayne enjoys freshwater and saltwater fishing, rugby league and rugby union, a beer or a glass of red wine and a order flutter on the horses. He is truly a railway systems expert with real world, hands-on, demonstrate, multidisciplinary experience of heavy rail, metro and light rail systems. Hi Wayne, welcome to Railway Transportation Systems Podcast. Raman, thanks for having me and uh, great initiative on the podcast too. It's great that people in industry can share their stories and, and their journeys. Uh, thanks, Wayne, for the kind words. So before we start, I would like to start with your professional story, especially railways. Yeah, the journey started, I guess, after school. I worked in a, a very small communications and IT business in, in Wollongong, the local area where I live, and was fortunate to start straight out of school with a traineeship. It saw me looking after a whole range of different IT systems and the, the business was predominantly founded on, I don't know if you remember the old pages, the beepers that we had back in the day before mobile phones took over the world. But uh, the, the pages and, yeah. and that instant messaging, the, the call center and all the services that made pages work were really fundamental to how a lot of modern day operation at the time anyway, at least worked. And everything from emergency services to your, your backstreet plumber, uh, everyone had a, a pager and I guess as mobile phones started to come in, they started to disappear. But working in a small business like that gave me an opportunity to, I guess, see not just how radio networks uh, come together, but certainly how IT, sort of low-level mainframes and, and, and basic IT infrastructure comes together to make a business work. And it also gave me an opportunity to check out, I guess, the, the technical side of life, but being put in front of clients, it, uh, it forced me to learn pretty quickly uh, about how to deal with complaints uh, how to address people and talk to people, but also uh, no doubt address the technical issues. So, so getting out of I guess the, the the growing pains of a small business, I decided to, to to pack it in and quit and look for a new challenge. And that saw me uh, come into the railways in two thousand and two. I had a pretty unconventional entry into railways in that whilst. I managed to get some very um, good, quick training. I was uh, put into one of the, the signal boxes at uh, at Sydney, which is a major, or was a major operating uh, railway signaling box, but now shut down. But I was looking after Atrix, which was a, a really important part of how, and still is a very essential part of how Sydney Trains operates its network. And as a control systems maintainer, uh, managed to... Uh, start up some 24-hour-based shifts or 12-hour shifts, nights and days. And 
I guess I started in December and, and come January after a few shifts one morning, I, uh, I, I caught the train home uh, from, from Sydenham and made my way back to Wollongong. Hopped on a train uh, at, uh, at Hurstville and I was a bit annoyed because it was a, an all-stops train and university was, was, was off at the time and it was, I don't know, it, just, it was just a, a very frustrating morning. But I uh, was sleeping on and off and the, left the train at Waterfall, um, sort of nodded off. And before I knew it, I was part of the Waterfall train disaster and on, oh. on the train. <laughs> Thankfully, on the second carriage, and certainly not the first one that uh, that took the brunt of impact, and thankfully not uh, the the other two preceding carriages that managed to flip uh, onto their sides. So, an introduction into a railway lot probably none have had in most ways. It was a, a an intense experience to say the least, but it certainly tests and proves probably who you are as a character, and I guess. Whilst my railway expertise, and or let's face it, I didn't have any at the time, I think how you act as a person in those situations is, is something you reflect back on. But at the time, I guess dealing with the public, I almost felt like a duty because um, I was wearing a, a Railcorp uniform at the time. So you are part of the, the brand and part of the service. But yeah. outside of that, uh, I guess you, you see the, the horrors of what a train tragedy does. And it certainly, you know, touches a lot of people, um, I guess, at the scene and for, for many years and decades later. When you hop off a, a, you know, a train like that that's been in a disaster and you do see, I guess, the genuine terrors and, and death that comes with it, uh, there's a lot of detail and a, a lot of things that I could share with you probably another time. But I guess when you go through that experience, what, one thing that was was probably quite heartening and, and probably almost inspirational in some respects was was how the rail industry supported me after that incident. It wasn't just about, you know, dealing with uh, a couple of police statements and, and helping emergency services. It was really about then taking all the, the very support that was on, on offer, whether it be counselling, but, but certainly people's interest in obviously the, the technical detail in some respects, but yeah. certainly me as a person gave me some comfort that uh, I guess the industry really is passionate about itself and how it works. So seeing that and being part of that so early into my journey was a really important part of probably who I am and, and how I've gotten to where I am today and will continue to go. So when you're front back up to work at a signal box like Sydney, a couple of weeks later after a, an event like that, the people that, that actually come and I guess are interested in I guess you, but then also take interest in the fact that you're still there, you're still a part of the the industry, the operation, and, and want to continue it. It just I don't know. It just allowed me to form bonds with people very quickly, whether it be the the signalers or the signal engineers or the maintainers or the chief engineer or the general managers, from top to bottom. People, people took interest and it just allowed me to accelerate my learning and understanding of railways because I can assure you there's no better way to learn a railway than from uh, a signal box or an operational center and then certainly play back the incident and understand why and how it got to it. I guess I take a lot of a lot of joy actually with uh, the recent commissioning of ETCS Level 1 around the Sydney Trains Network because you know, be also being part of the inquiry where you, I guess, interrogated and questioned about what you saw and what you did. And then, of course, you see the outcomes and the recommendations and, you know, to see the one of the key engineering mitigations and solutions put in place and now in service is is really great to see. And I actually let uh, the commissioning engineer, uh, the lead engineer, know this week actually how, how pleased I was. And, uh, yeah, he, he understood, which, which was great. So... So, yeah, that was a very accelerated way of learning railways, the politics, and I guess the, the people that make up a railway and how it works. Yeah, it's an unusual tale, uh, a remarkable and distinguished story when, uh, to, to be honest, uh, that incident also gave me an opportunity to come to Sydney. I was part of ATP and I was I really worked hard to commission the first ATP on the Sydney Trains Network, so in 29th March 2019. That's really pleasing to hear, Ramin, because yeah. uh, I can I actually ended up working with the ATP program. So 
actually straight after the incident, I was, uh, I guess I was a maintainer for a while in the control system space. I then got into the, the design, the design aspect of control systems and then into project management. So I was with communications and control systems for the best part of about six years. And uh, it really gave me an opportunity to see how, how those systems work. But I, I think where my life really started to change was um, coming into the ATP project and actually standing up the business case. So it was quite fulfilling, actually, to see that you could contribute to helping stand up not just the the business case, but then actually kicking off the the wayside delivery program as well. With at the time was was Novara and the alliance there yeah. to see that uh, I guess come off a page and then start to come into reality. And hearing you too, Raman, that you've also been part of that as well with its culmination into commissioning this week. It's just it's fantastic. Yeah. Amazing. It, it's really great to see at last it has come to end. And I think there are only a few bits and pieces before they can wind up. Yeah. And then we move to level two. Yeah. And that's ETCS level absolutely. two. Absolutely. That's exciting. You know, when I know your expertise in different disciplines, but I also know uh, that you have worked in light rail, heavy rail, and metro projects. What do you think is the main difference between these three? I guess we'll start with metro projects. I mean, they're all about precision. They're almost like the the F one of of railways in some respects. If um, you, you take into account the the short headways, the the high frequency service, the the minimal route and stopping variations is all that minimal variation in operation gives them an opportunity to to create a system that's really fast, very very accurate. Certainly where it's tuned and um, and tested and commissioned properly, but I guess giving ourselves an opportunity to, with every every second of a, a metro, every second counts, uh, particularly with the timetable and the way journey time and headway comes together. And having high resolution signaling like CBTC gives an operator uh, an opportunity to to chase that time and and manage that performance. And I guess that that level of resolution and those types of signaling systems, I mean, it, it's it's a main difference between a heavy rail and a light rail system. But a metro really is designed to to allow that, uh, I guess, high volume, high movement of people through, uh, I guess, a, a city system. The fact that it operates in tunnels, viaducts and heavily quarantined areas also makes it quite unique as well. And I guess when you remove the driver reaction aspect, being able to help manage daily life situations, particularly with people running on tracks and being able to adjust uh, a service as, as those life situations come into play means that you end up with a lot more systems or the train itself and the infrastructure are a lot more tightly integrated. And that creates a lot more complexity, a lot more system interfaces. It makes a lot more stuff that, that needs to go right. And it also creates a lot of things that can go wrong. That's where a really strong systems engineering expert approach and a really well-run design phase all the way through to that commissioning and handover to an operator, that life cycle is absolutely fundamental just considering that complexity and those things that you need to get right so they don't go wrong. I guess heavy rail, you look at heavy rail as it's kind of like everything to everyone. It needs to deal with hauling passengers, but it deals with hauling freight. It needs to give its, uh, because of the, the mixed fleet and the mixed rolling stock and the fact that it, it does need to accommodate both means that it doesn't have the Swiss watch performance and the opportunity to work like a metro. So it, uh, it, it certainly creates unique situations for operators, particularly where you have got mixed styles of operation between freight and, uh, and passenger service. It makes timetabling a lot more complicated. It makes the control systems that also regulate it a lot more complicated from everything that generates that timetable all the way through to the passenger information system, um, being able to deal with the variations in service. So the the people that really pull together and, and integrate a heavy rail system are really doing it knowing that uh, you, you, they're, they're almost acting as the arteries in some respects for, for the country. All those freight halls, all those um, freight moves, they're on the track for a reason and uh, getting them getting from point A to point B is is critical and so is the you know Joe Blow who's getting to the office as well. So 
the heavy rail system and, and, and it coming together, um, and certainly now that you're looking at ETCS level two, like you mentioned before, Raman, and that's certainly the next step in, in Sydney, but also many other metropolitan systems around the world. It's exciting to see that there actually is opportunity to start to bring a lot more precision back to back to railways. And yep. who knows, ATO might be around the corner as well for ETCS level two. But um, yeah, it, it's it's exciting to see, uh, but there's certainly two, two very different um, operating types. The, the light rail system is, is probably one that I probably enjoy the most, to be honest. It's, um, it's where road and rail meet, and it's, it's highly complex. Everything from the passenger coming into both the road and rail domain, the engineering of how rail and road come together, trying to keep a road system operational or trying to get a rail system um, integrated and running through it. it. It's a very careful balancing act, and... When you take out, I guess, the, the, the operational side, the delivery of a, a light rail project is is also very challenging considering you're not often you know, delivering in a rail corridor. So you haven't got nice fenced off sections that you can come through and uh, undertake all your, your cable routes and civil works and drainage and track work. You're often building in the middle of the street and trying to deal with the public at the same time. So you know, the construction of it's a lot more complex, but... The engineering and even the testing commissioning of it, where you're having to deal with a lot of nights, a lot of coordination with traffic control, a lot of separation of people and public and you know, unproven, untested systems. It, it's a highly volatile, very dynamic situation. It's uh, If you can get it right and do it well, you, you've done well yourself. Thanks, Wayne. Great answer. You know, you actually touched every single part. You touched the operational aspects. You touched the maintenance aspect. You touched the interoperabilities. It's a great answer. You know, we just discussed about the different types of railways. And now I know through your introduction that you worked in road projects as well. So what's the difference between these two, rail and road? Surprisingly, not that much. It'll sound odd. If you get rid of a, a railway interlocking, which helps manage the obviously the, the safe monitoring and use of points and, and conflicting moves and the like, if you remove the interlocking and, I guess, conventional point operation, you're more or less replacing track circuits and axle counters with traffic loops, inducted traffic loops, and then overlay, I guess, the equivalent of a traffic management system or traffic control system. It's helping not just regulate and, and, and supervise the amount of traffic in a tunnel, but it's also helping coordinate system responses based on what's happening at the time. So if you've got a high congestion in the tunnel, you've got automation given through those traffic loops and the ability for the system to see how much traffic's in a tunnel. And it, it will react and, and do as required, um, depending on how it's designed and configured. You look at the, the traffic signage, you look at the, uh, the ability to control uh, doors and, and other um, industrial aspects of, of typical industrial automation, sorry, they're highly similar um, with with what's required and how they come together. The, the only other probably genuine similarity is is the project delivery method or the, the culture. They are historically and probably still are very civil-led. The cost and the, the risk of civil works to, I guess, systems are often inverse to each other. And I think in the road industry, that's certainly no different. And from my limited experience, given that uh, with Northcax and a few other small jobs, is the the system side of the project isn't really highlighted till sort of that last third of the program where people start to switch on to its importance. And uh, I guess whilst it's great to get the attention there, uh, because they predominantly are so civil focused, they don't often get the attention and and probably solve all the problems they could back up in the design phase. But, I mean, outside of that, they're still very public-facing, as we know. They still need to be tested. They still need to be proven before they're put into operation. And uh, and once they go in, um, it's whether it's a railway or a roadway, the, the public use it, and no news is good news. Yeah, it looks like siblings, railways and roadways. Very similar. And great insights. Thanks, Wayne. And uh, looking into your experience so for the last 20 odd years what have you seen the changes have you seen any drastic changes in the railway projects from your beginning of the career and till today and if so what are they yeah i 
I think the biggest thing I've noticed is probably the the amount of available experience and and probably practice competence on jobs. The uh, the industry when I certainly first joined, if you can if you think of uh, I guess experience is like a pyramid where the top of the pyramid is the, the guys that have got 40 or 50 years plus experience and when you go to them you just know you're going to get the right answer and that that pyramid as it as it gets wider it's it's just a distribution of of those years in in service and industry and when i first came into railways back into uh into rick and rail court back back when i so certainly started was the availability to to those people in the pyramid to help you know acquire knowledge and ask questions was so readily available it was actually quite incredible and in hindsight we were quite blessed because you know having having all that experience come around certainly in organizations like railcorp meant that you could come up with i guess really good solutions to problems quite quickly and what i've noticed through industry now and especially with the amount of projects the amount of mega projects that are happening concurrently is it's very difficult to walk into a lot of organisations now and see a really steep pyramid, a pyramid of competence. If anything, that pyramid of competence or an experience is starting to flatten a little bit. So I think the time it takes to, to, to come up with solutions to problems and, and probably gain a, a level of confidence on decision-making is probably becoming slightly more challenged because you just the, the foundations there are just not the same. Agree. What an answer! Because I was about to ask this, and you actually covered it. So after listening to all this story, Wayne, I was just imagining. So what? How can people become a railway systems experts? Yeah, that's a that's a good question because uh, I guess railways, in a lot of cases, aren't a natural thing for people to gravitate to in uh, in their schooling and in their career and and, and career paths. If you look at uh, universities as an example, and the general curriculums in play at the moment, you've generally got specialised engineering courses, which obviously focus on certain disciplines, your civil engineers, electrical, computer science, etc. Now, there are some opportunities in the asset management space and with rail systems, uh, but they're historically, from what I can see at the moment anyway, uh, postgraduate opportunities. So by default, you need to go down a discipline or a science-based path probably to, to kickstart your career in the best way possible. But railway systems experts, and I've only I've only fallen into it by a fluke and through attitude. So I, I got into rail systems when I finished, uh, I guess, with, with Rail Corp back in about 2011, 2012. I actually went and joined John Holland, so a major T1 civil uh, company, construction company. But was given a lot of internal opportunity to actually sprout my wings and actually learn more about rail systems and systems engineering. And I actually took that opportunity through the projects that they were running through their country to work with a lot of individual discipline engineers and uh, I guess really start to understand and, and start to practice, uh, I guess, how all those multi-disciplines of railways come together to actually create a system. So in terms of how newcomers to the industry come on and be a railway expert, it's really about attitude. It's not about looking at your individual um, area of expertise within one discipline. It's about taking the mindset and understanding about what the other discipline and what the other person does and what their contribution is to a railway and how it works as a complex system. And as you start to work, it's not something that you're necessarily taught. It's something you need to acquire. It's something that you work at. And when you have it, you probably never will have it because not everyone knows everything. But a railway system is, I guess, the makeup of all those all those you know complex disciplines and bringing them together and understanding how they work and how they need to work to come to the conclusion of a project is something you just need to be part of and have the attitude and, and uh, I guess, dedication to get yourself into a spot where you can work with people and understand what the big picture looks like. But the, the other major part that goes with it too is you are – in some regards, you're better off starting your career as an operator and maintainer. If you work backwards from what the product does and how it got there, it's a really good way to understand. Uh, certainly, when you, we, if if you get into a design role or if you get into a commissioning role, if you understand how it works or how it's maintained or what happens when something breaks, you've got a better chance of understanding about either how to prevent it or make it a better. And having that upfront in your career. 
um, as soon as possible gives you an opportunity to add more value and I guess and also understand what those other disciplines do as well. I completely agree with you and even with the new graduates, interns or scholars who join us, I say the same story because you don't get to learn signaling in the universities. So when I joined as well, I was in a two years training, six months rigorous theoretical training and one and a half year practical training. And as you said, I actually worked in the maintenance for first nine years to understand how it actually works. And I completely agree with you. It relates to me. I feel as if you're telling my own story. <laughs> so we, <laughs> yeah, it was a it was a great, great, great discussion, Wayne. And, uh, you know, when you even spoke about the completion of the projects, so now I'm going to touch some technical differences within the project. So as you are a principal systems integration manager, what I have seen is people get a lot of confused between systems integration and project integration. Mm -hmm. Can you explain this difference? Yeah. Uh, there's actually a third one too, operational integration. Yeah. Yeah. And a third dimension to that too. But if you try and correlate it to maybe like a real life scenario, so people can understand, I guess, why and how they work. If you think of project integration as, as a marriage, as starting up a marriage. So if you've got two parties that, that, that want to come together and achieve something in life, then I guess the, the journey starts when you first meet. It starts when you start yeah. to, uh, you know, define your aspirations about what you want in life and how things you think should be done. You set out your plans about what you, how many children you want to have, how big your house wants to be, if you want a boat, if you want all those good things in life. And I, I guess that that project integration is really about setting not just your expectations, but that also setting requirements about what what you think is going to make you happy and what you need to live that life. So as you specify those requirements and I guess you, you you get married, which is probably the equivalent of a contract in today's terms, and you make a commitment, yeah. you, you start to get on with it. And the systems integration starts to kick in where you take those requirements in life. And a, a great example might be building a house. You want to go build a house, you'll you'll set your requirements, you'll you'll know how many people need to sleep there, you know you want to house two cars, you know you want to house a boat. You know the neighbourhood it has. You want to maybe put CCTV in and other things because you maybe you don't trust a neighbour or, or something. But uh, I think as you spell these things out, the system integration really kicks in and taking you know requirements equivalent to something like that, putting them into something that can actually be translated and used to start taking something off a page and actually bring it into real life. And the V model, if you look at the, the European standards around how systems engineering comes into place, yeah, EN five hundred one two. Correct. The top of that V model is is where those requirements and you know building a house is, in some regards is no different. You're at the top of that V model, and you want to take what you need to do and take them down that left hand side of the V. So that'll include all the initial design phasing, engaging with the architect, understanding with the electrician, you know how much power we're going to use. If there's a solar system on the roof, if there's data cabling and, and Wi-Fi needed through the house, and you just you work through every single discipline, whether the pool is going to be in the backyard, how are you going to build and construct a pool correctly uh, without breaking too much stuff? Does the pool need plumbing? Does it need power? Does it need this? So you, as you take all these requirements and you start to design it, you engage the right parties to help bring you on the journey. You'll engage an architect to help bring the, the design of the house and the layout and all, everything in place. You'll bring the electrical side in to start designing up schematics and things You'll bring the civil engineers to make sure the drainage on the block and everything else is good. And I guess as you as you go through that journey and you start to take that design, you really are measuring that progression of design against those fundamental requirements that you and your partner set up at the time of really yeah, setting that dream up. And then if you think of that right-hand side of the, the V is as it gets built, I'd find it rare that anyone wouldn't go and inspect as well the house being built making sure that everything that you, you wanted on a page is actually brought into real life. And, you know, life's no different when you're building that house. And you'll see things come on as it's progressively built. You'll see various testing of electrical elements. You'll see the plumbing tested. And eventually it gets to a point where you're on the verge of being able to move in. Now, I guess moving in 
is probably the equivalent of where systems engineering starts to, to fall off and operational integration comes into play. The operational integration is, is really then about, well, how am I going to mow the lawns? How am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to keep the pool clean? How do I make sure that uh, how often do I have to get the house repainted? All these elements that you've got to plan for if you really want to see this asset through life is where operational integration comes into play and making sure that if, if you're not going to mow the lawn yourself and you're going to arrange a lawnmower guy, then you give yourself an opportunity to do that and pick someone out and get it done. If you look at what we need to do to be able to live our lives, the, the project integration, whilst it starts and kicks off the dream, systems engineering is about implementing it and then operating it is about taking on the, the realities of taking a house on, operating it and maintaining it. And that project integration, I mean, a project has a start and a finish too. And that's an important part that people need to understand that's at the conclusion of building that house as a project, it's it goes on as an asset, and then you'll move on to the next project and go through really the same fundamentals. Brilliant! What what a nice way of explaining things. I feel like I'm listening to a story, nice little story. You made the complex thing look easy, which I can tell my audience that it's not really that easy, but you made look it easy, and yeah, it's absolutely correct so every single step you described i can relate it and i actually see it as well so we spoke a lot about railways now i want to talk about something about wayne cooney how do your closest friends describe you wayne Ooh, uh, i guess one of the things i've found interesting most of my friends actually don't work in railways they actually don't work in large infrastructure projects they're they're a hybrid of different industries and I actually think that's important to be honest because you do need to step away from your professional life and and see certainly the other parts and listen to to the other parts of, of life and society but I guess how my friends describe me oh, probably a bit of a goofball in some regards but I'd, I'd like to hope to think that I'm a I guess a caring and, and certainly compassionate friend that. That takes time to to hang out and and really enjoy life together. We certainly have a, a great time, you know, fishing and and, and enjoying all, all of life's pleasures. To be honest, and uh, now we've all got kids, we're all enjoying that journey together as well. And uh, and certainly the the future chapters to come. Completely agree that the main key part of our role and to maintain our mental health as well, we need to have that attitude to let go our professional life and have a life. Out, apart from professional life it's very key so when you come back i think we are much more refreshed and energetic to do the things and you do it brilliantly i know that and one more thing is uh, how can we generate these great ideas in our organization so we keep on people keep on moving in the organizations and every organization has so many changes and they work differently so how can we as an employee generate great ideas? I guess good ideas come with tough questions. And sometimes we probably, as leaders, we may not actually give the, the younger people or more importantly, new people to industry an opportunity to ask people questions and actually listen to the answers. If we want great ideas, we should be asking the tough questions and it might be problem solving around something as simple as, as how we construct something or, or, or alternate staging. It could be ideas about generating awareness of certain issues. It could be safety problems on site or other things. There are so many more new ways to, I guess, share information, communicate and, and genuinely innovate that sometimes you just need to be able to just ask those hard questions and give people an opportunity to, to share their thoughts and listen. The other part is you got to listen. Brilliant. Even I'm a strong advocate of listening and the leadership. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks for sharing that. Apart from that, as you're working in one of the key project, key major project um, in Sydney, and I always seen in my personal life that there is always a conflict between the in the senior leadership there's a conflict between technical and project management. So in your role, how do you balance this between technical and project management and how do you get about resolving the conflict? You certainly can't have one without the other. 
which is unfortunate. But yeah, I mean, it comes back to what we sort of talked about before around systems engineering versus project integration is that project, that the project management side is really fundamental. You do need to work to a budget. You do need to work to a schedule and a timeline. Now, sometimes the, the project requirements or the project management aspects and the technical management, they often conflict because everyone wants more time. Everyone wants more, I guess, opp- opportunity to to help invest in you know improving a, a problem or a product or improve performance or spend more time doing analysis. And you know the old law of diminishing returns comes into play. And sometimes that's where experience is also quite fundamental to balancing, I guess, some of the the key elements of technical management. Of course, we want a product fit for purpose. We want it safe, but there's only it, it does get to a point where certain analysis does generate that law of diminishing returns. You won't achieve a, a higher grade of performance or, or aspirational need because it probably doesn't exist. And I guess the good thing about railways is because there's so many of them around the world, there's also a lot of, of precedent and a lot of quiet experience out there too that allows you to make decisions quickly, both in technical and project management. But I guess when you look at project management, one thing we, we probably don't do well enough at times and we need to get better at to inform the technical management is to make sure that we work backwards from the end, give ourselves an opportunity to stage things in and allow the delivery of the job to actually drive how it's to be engineered, staged and progressively built. And you know, giving an opportunity for both of those to come together allows things to be done a lot more controlled, hopefully with a lot more stress and a lot more predictability, which makes both parties happy. That's, uh, you explained pretty well, Ben, very interesting and all those critical aspects you have shown it in the simplest way so in this whole podcast while i was hearing you it was all the technical we spoke most of the technical issues and you never looked it like it it is like technical and you made it like a easy storytelling uh, we really need people like you in the industry and uh, before i let you go in what do you think what's your advice to the newcomers into this industry yeah, I mean, you probably wouldn't want to go the same route I went around, you know, hopping on a train and getting in a train disaster or a train crash. Yeah, definitely not. Uh, that was certainly unique. But uh, one of the important things is that you don't don't think that life or your employer owes you anything. You need to take the initiative to actually go out and work out why things work, how they work, and then how you can add value to making either a project happen or an operations or service run better. You have got the ability to actually influence change. You have got the ability to actually improve things. And the attitude that goes with that also really fundamentally determines your success. So apply that positive attitude, go and ask questions. And then I guess more importantly as well with this is stay in your lane, is know what you're supposed to do and understand what others do. But the, take the advice and, uh, of others and learn and build build your journey. Take your journey progressively. You're not going to get there quick. It'll, it'll come to you. Thank you. Great advice and overall great insights. Thank you, Wayne, giving your time and sharing your insights with us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ruben. I believe everyone listening to this podcast has got something to take away from today's discussion. If you like this podcast, please listen, follow and share this podcast within your network. If you believe we should be sharing your story or someone within your network, there is a railway leader who should be here sharing his or her contribution to this industry. Contact me on railway transportation systems at gmail.com. Thank you for your time today. See you next fortnight. Until then, stay safe and take care of yourself.